Yes, sir. Okay, so in three, two, Good afternoon. As chair, I now call to order the November 16th, 2023 meeting of the Equity Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Equity Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through team, Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Handy or Ms. Seabolt if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Seabolt, please call the roll of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ms. Harvey? Present. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Frempong? Ms. Lichter? Ms. Dulowski? Present. Dr. Savoy? Present. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Siebel. The first item on the agenda is a special education strategic plan, and for that, I call on Ms. Allison Myers. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, this runs very different than our curriculum committee, so sorry for my pause with that. Um, good afternoon. I am excited to share with you our special education strategic plan. Um, I am Allison Myers, executive director for the Department of Special Education. Um, this is a presentation that some of you have made, have may have seen parts of before. We did do this through curriculum committee, um, but I'm excited about the opportunity to also be able to present to this group. So the special education strategic plan was designed with the intent to reimagine how we are supporting our students receiving special education service and their families. Next slide. I'm still seeing the first slide. Is anyone saying anything different? No. Okay. Great, okay, the next one is fine, perfect. The next one, please. Great, thank you so much. So Baltimore County Public Schools has had historic challenges related to our support and services for our students receiving special education services. We engage in the strategic planning process to begin to turn the curve for our students. We have been in, we have continued to be in needs improvement status on state accountability measures for over 15 years. Uh, while the measures identified as needs improvement have not remained the same, we've uh, had fluctuation in where we've needed to show needs improvement. We have continued to um, be identified in a state of needs improvement at various levels of intensity. We have systemic achievement concerns for students receiving special education services. We continue to be disproportionate in the identification, placement, and suspension of our Black and African American students. And finally, there has been a call by families for increased transparency around the IEP team process. Our families are asked are asking to be informed partners and to have regularly sharing of information to allow them to make informed decisions about their student services. Next slide, please. So this slide shows uh, kind of the deliberate intent we had to engage parents, school administrators, and system leadership, as well as our county, our partner agencies, to ensure that we had feedback um, from diverse stakeholder groups in developing the plan. Um, well, we used our department leadership team um, as the partners in development of the key priorities and strategies that we're working through. We purposefully ensured the development of the broad plan in collaboration with those folks outside of the Department of Special Education. Often um, our work within the Department of Special Education, whether that was audits or other work that's been done over time, really focused just on department members. And the difference with this was that we really made that um, deliberate effort to engage across the system, across um, outside stakeholders to ensure that really we were um, 
making sure that feedback was, um, we were able to make a deliberate plan with how we want to move our system forward around special education services. Another key portion of this that should be highlighted is that um, when the plan was first developed, we then took it back out to the same, same stakeholders and asked for feedback to ensure we are hitting um, those areas that we needed to hit um, and to ensure that um, those adjustments were made. Overall, with regards to constituent engagement, we had over um, close to 300 touch points of how we um, engaged in order to um, move this work forward. Next slide, please. So I'm excited to be able to share our new vision, mission, and belief statements for the Department of Special Education. Um, as sometimes I take a moment and read these, um, but you can see them on the slide. Um, our vision being that all students receiving special education services are embraced by their school communities and achieve their goals in school and life. The mission important of working collaboratively to foster the unique strengths of every student receiving special education services. Our belief statements are really key here, um, as you can see. These were core, our core values and our beliefs um, with regards to how we um, believe special education services should be delivered um, in our system. Celebrating the strengths and abilities of all students, building and sustaining trusting relationships with students, families, schools, partners, and each other, supporting students in achieving their IEP and personal goals, serving our students, families, and schools with compassion and care, practicing equity, inclusion, and belonging, using evidence-based practices and data-driven decision-making and being transparent and making continuous improvements. Next slide, please. So the 10-year shared result are those high-level, uh, what we call population-level results or high-level results of how, what we see, how what we believe this, um, where we want to see for our students in 10 years. So these 10-year shared results are those things that we believe true if we're successful with implementation of the strategic plan. You also note in here that they are aligned with high-level results to the blueprint for Maryland's future. So you can see with those five is that our services are fully funded. Example, our educators and leaders receive rigorous comprehensive training and professional development. All children receiving special ed services and their families and caregivers feel accepted, embraced, and supported by their school community, which is huge. Students and their families have a range of accessible and comprehensive supports and resources for growth and achievement. And all students receiving special education services meet or exceed educational outcomes to become college, career, and community ready. And I highlight that one in that often when we're talking about um, kind of college and community ready, we also we, we leave out that idea of community. So um, in feedback from our uh, CCAC and our advisory committees and with others and our parents really wanted to highlight that to be college career and community because some of our students that community ready aspect is critical. Next slide. So the strategies on this roadmap, um, the strategies to get us to those population level results. So 10 year results are the meat of the plan, but here you will see our three priorities. Priorities being our people, our services and our culture and the corresponding strategies we've identified, which will drive our work forward. You will see that some of these strategies are very targeted and some are broader in nature. All will have tactics aligned to carry out each strategy. So the exciting part of this um, is this plan was really developed over the course of last school year um, and then uh, was finalized during summer months. Um, and we've been very, um, excited to with um, Dr. Rogers support to really champion the, her support and champion these efforts, moving this work forward. Um, and you can see throughout this, um, I'll have the opportunity in coming months to present on the progress that we've made in our plan, which is really exciting um, during quarter one. Um, but just kind of highlighting in here that these are really, this is the what we need to do to get where we want to be. Um, and I can excited to share that we are doing, it's, it's allowing for alignment, it's allowing us to stay really focused on our um, vision and mission in order to change outcomes for kids. Next slide, please. So here are the performance measures. Uh, we believe that accountability for moving this work forward is critical to truly improving outcomes for our students and families. For each of the three priority areas, we have identified performance measures with actionable timelines for implementation. We have additional benchmarks, which will be measured throughout the year to ensure we're moving towards these broader performance measures. Um, 
I will highlight that we have indicated 100% as a measure that you'll notice on some of these as outcomes with the goal of um, we're emphasizing our commitment to moving this work rapidly forward. So these are uh, performance measures that we would look to work on between for a three year period. However, we really hold ourselves to um, being able to hit on some of these right away. An example of that might be um, the 100% of department staff participate in customer service training annually. So our culture, that was something that I was able to hit on, um, you know, and we addressed immediately this summer. So some of these are things that we're able to do much quicker than others, um, but we are committed to moving all, um, all of these measures forward and it allows us to be very deliberate in our attempts. Next slide, please. So while we do have the comprehensive list of strategies, which I noted two slides earlier, um, that are aligned to each priority, as a department, we prioritize strategies for 24. These priorities, prioritize strategies really align to those performance measures so that we can be ensured we're making um, deliberate efforts and making gains quickly um, in the, for the best interests of our students and families. Um, we anticipate that these having influence in meeting those performance measures. We will, of course, continue to work on all strategies, uh, but these are those of focus for our first year. Um, and like I said, you know, as we're going through these, the, the work is ongoing, um, but these are our targeted strategies for how we are um, kind of driving the work of our department this year. This work, in addition to all the other things that we do as a department, but this is really prioritizing kind of the above and where we um, want to be able to move work for our students forward. Next slide, please. So this next slide outlines the timeline, um, kind of that from planning to action, um, just highlights what we have done in this process and how it works. Um, so the management planning we talked about for May and July was what we were doing, how we're going to get that up and running. Really focused during August on our implementation training with my team as far as how to work, move this work forward and to also have conversations with other departments. As I've indicated, this isn't a plan that can just live within the Department of Special mm -hmm. Education. It's a plan that is um, really systemic in nature um, and by design to ensure that we're engaging stakeholders across our system um, to ensure that we are um, really able to impact outcomes for our students receiving special education services. And that really then leads to that system-wide rollout of the plan. So I had um, the fantastic opportunity to be able to present um, with Dr. Rogers um, during the community forums. We did one in August and one in September. Um, I think some of you may have been able to participate in those, um, which allowed us to present this in shorter form to our families, um, which are really that largest um, group that we really are trying to engage around this um, with being able to explain. We've heard from our families loud and clear that they need, like I said, transparency, but information, wanting to be meaningful participants in their IEP team process, wanting um, best outcomes for their students, wanting to understand why and how we do what we do. Um, so that was a fantastic opportunity to hear from our families and other stakeholders in the system um, and really has led to even some um, kind of, you know, new initiatives or other things that we might be engaging in. Next slide, please. And finally, here are some of those early wins. Um, we are looking for immediate wins, so stakeholders start to feel a tangible difference. Like I said, we're going to get into more specifics of this um, during upcoming um, presentation. But for today, these are um, some that we were excited about, have actually been shared um, somewhat before, but can I can expand about professional learning communities. Um, that is something that we committed to um, over the summer to ensure that our um, anyone who's in a job-alike role has opportunities for professional learning on like a six week cycle um, in order to support. And that's really with that intent of wanting to retain our teachers, wanting to ensure that our special educators, related service providers, um, anyone kind of within that role of special education is able to support our students and wants to be valued and have the professional learning they need. Um, we've had ongoing collaboration with content offices. Um, an exciting part has been redefining our family support position to increase the parent and caregiver advocacy involvement and communication. So um, you may have seen um, in recent even days yesterday, we had um, a course on IEP process that was for families to participate in. We've also had the opportunity to do an in the know video on this process where I introduced myself and this strategic plan, but also um, have had um, at least one podcast on the IEP process and there'll be more of those upcoming. So it's just exciting around kind of the different levels of engagement with families and our opportunity to um, provide them the information and access that they've been um, asking for. Um, not to go through the others like too explicitly, um, 
I said partnering with community advocates to ensure unique needs of families and students with disabilities, ensuring ensuring that we are um, hearing from folks and adjusting or providing professional, I call it professional learning or learning for families. Um, tiered professional learning that I referenced for our new special educators throughout the upcoming school year, that's been a focus for us. We heard loud and clear that we were losing special educators um, early on uh, at, from their having difficulty with the um, IEP team process and compliance and wanting to be able to understand that. So that's something that we um, really have kind of leaned into with regards to supporting our first year special educators. The other thing that I'm proud to say that one of the areas that we really um, have been deliberate in is um, taking a really close look at our um, pro our placement process for students with disabilities needing a more restrictive setting and ensuring we just finished professional learning with principals, with IEP chairs um, around um, kind of the deliberate efforts and process around what is the data indicating the students need something more restrictive um, for their services. And that was something that we were committed to revamping during the summer and then rolling out during quarter one, which we um, just kind of met that target. Um, and then I think just a couple others is creating the look for tools to support consistency across service delivery models for our students and that customer service training for our staff, really ensuring that we're being responsive that to both families and to schools um, and to ensure that we are providing, um, you know, what it is they're looking for and that it feels a meaningful support in a timely fashion. Next slide, please. I talk really quickly, I can tell. <laughs> and this final slide um, is just uh, allowing for questions. Um, and again, to thank you for this opportunity, but I'll open, um, open for questions if that works. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Are there any questions for Ms. Myers regarding her presentation? You're muted, Ms. Lichter. You're still Ms. muted. Lichter? Sorry, on the last slide that you spoke about the, the progress. Yes. Um, I think through social media and the other avenues, we can definitely see the increase in the um, very purposeful family, I guess, family education, professional learning. What, what you also had on that slide, so thank you for that. I think um, that really is um, filling a need that probably has existed for a very long time. On that slide also, um, trying to remember what it said, it talked about working closer with advocates Mm -hmm. So um, can you kind of go into that a little bit more? Because as a board, a lot of times we do hear um, mm -hmm. from advocates. So um, what, what does that look like? Sure. So, um, you know, we we. We see our advocates as um, informative around process, right? So, um, I, you know, kind of regardless of what is said at different times, um, they are they're advocating for our students. So what are those areas? What are the trends we're seeing? Um, what are things that they think would be helpful that they often will hear from families, whether that's communication, whether that's families feeling like they're able to take um, an informed process in the IEP team process. Uh, we just really try to hear um, even kind of between the lines, right? What are those kind of um, things that are coming up um, of pattern that we can lean into? The other aspect of it working um, with some of them is through CCAC. So we do have advocates that come to CCAC um, that will share kind of what their experiences are. Our parent um, liaison um, has been fantastic with that. Ms. Golden um, has actually had several um, folks that have been reaching out to her regularly on the behalf of their families um, and with the appropriate um, uh, re, um, permissions for sharing information, um, she's able to kind of have different conversations and just being able to, you know, we want to, we want families to, it's their right to have an advocate to help them navigate the process. Special education is really complicated. We also want that to be productive. So we often really just try to hear them and then identify are there area other areas of, like I said, um, learning for families, workshops we can provide, um, or do we need to lead into um, schools on a particular issue to be able to support schools with navigating kind of whatever those needs are? Thanks. I know that it's so individualized. So sometimes when the advocates are advocating for a specific family, sometimes it sounds more trend global. in nature versus like more global than just being an individual. So it's it's sometimes it's hard to discriminate. Is this in, you know, a one isolated individual or is this a pattern and trend? So anything that you're doing to kind of work with the advocates to kind of discern mm -hmm. between the two of them is really helpful. So thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's sometimes, you know, we we hear similar, right? We we monitor um, where the concerns are. They do call us. We see, you know, even with the um, resolution process, if there's families that are feeling that they need to make an MSD complaint, for example, what they don't have an advocate or those that land um, in mediation due process, kind of we really try to pay attention to those patterns, um, really working with the state on progress reporting and other things. So we get a lot of data points um, that allow us to kind of see at the same time with like what you're saying, is it a one-off or is this a trend? And even the one-offs, if it's student specific that we need to lean into, we absolutely will because we know, right? It's um, it, it's it's someone's child that is struggling and they're feeling a certain way. So, you know, regardless, we lean in differently and whether we do a global kind of picture of it or work with that school in particular, but um, no, thanks for the question. Cause I know you hear a lot from folks. Um, so it's helpful to kind of give a perspective around that. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Lusky? Hello? Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, it really seems that a lot of thought and work was put into this to make it a um, improved work environment and improved outcomes for um, special education students. Um, I just have a question. It's a little bit unrelated to this, but I know with the staffing shortage, um, and especially with the the IEPs and the one-on-one -on -one, um, instruction, um, is the situation improving this year compared to last year in terms of filling in um, teacher vacancies as well as those power educators for um, student needs? Thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so um, our vacancy rate was lower starting the school year. Um, and I will say, you know, our staffing team has done a fantastic job engaging um, special educators and wanting to come to our system and retaining them. Um, the, the bonus around that was definitely helpful for us um, for this year. Um, and then, like I said, you know, our focus has really been on professional learning and engagement and ensuring that folks feel like they have the resources they need to do the job they want to do. Um, we know that staffing around special education continues to be a need. Um, we've had an increase in the number of students um, over the last year, and uh, we haven't received an increase in special education positions. So that is something, of course, it's, you know, advocated for. Um, and, you know, CCAC and special educators, and you, he you hear that, right? Is that that need for other positions? Um, you, at the same time, we realize that, um, you know, there's budget implications, you know, other things, and we have been able to fill who we've been able to fill. So that's great. Um, but I really think, you know, the work around that professional learning is critical and also the professional learning for our general educators, because I think that's the one, that's an aspect to continue to kind of bring light to and continue to stay in focus is special educators are one provider and pair educators support with being a provider as well, but our general educators for the majority of our students are that first provider. So ensuring that they have the resources that they need and the understanding for the implementation of the IEP. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Okay. All right, anybody else have a question for Ms. Myers? I have just one more. The um, part-time contractual positions, I don't know if they're contract, I think they're, I don't know if they're contractual, but the part-time positions that were, that schools could hire for someone to do the, more of the IET team, mm -hmm. how's yes. that going? Yeah, so um, that's been a good avenue um, for schools to be able to, um, you're speaking of the IEP team lead positions, like, which are those contractual, hours. Right. yep, 16 hours, right. contractual part-time, 16 hours, um, and that allowed for schools directly to hire folks. Um, we have heard, we have a group of those that have been hired, um, and we actually offer different professional learning for them because we realize they come with a different kind of set, skill set, depending on what their experience had been previously. Um, but those that have had them have had good experiences. That's been our feedback. Um, it's an added Added support because we know the impact of having to run team on APs and wanting our system principals to be able to be engaged in instruction more than they were. So I think all in all, that's been great. It speaks right to the ongoing need for that IEP team facilitator of some sort type of role <laughs> to be able to support 
especially in our elementary schools. Um, we've had some schools that might have waited um, to fill the position and kind of saw how this year started. And then we've had, and I've had some that have reached out more recently inquiring about, you know, filling that role. Um, and some that reached out immediately and were like right on it with wanting to fill. So it just kind of has been a little bit um, fluc fluctuates as far as how it is. But my understanding overall is that we've had positive feedback around this. And that that's funded through special ed budget? Um, yeah, that, so it's been operating funded. Oh, operating funded, okay. Which is special, I mean, it came, yes. Yeah, special okay. education operating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I know we're just starting the process. So the reason I ask is because we're about to start the whole budget. Well, you guys have been in the process. It's about to come to us soon. Yes. Um, so is that something that you're advocating for, for the next budget cycle? Yeah, so we, we've been pretty, um, yes, yeah, so we've definitely um, advocating for that IEP facilitator of some sort um, with regards to supporting schools, just acknowledging, um, and Dr. Rogers has been really um, upfront about this with, with us as far as, you know, um, that it's a, we know it's a need, right? It's a priority around special education and how we can support schools in order for, again, our, our um, administrators, especially in elementary school, to be able to be leading into instruction and doing the other things. Um, so I'm hopeful that that's something that we're able to continue. Okay. I just wanted to know if we have anything about the effects of it as we advocate for, for yeah, pieces we, of things. Great. Yes. Um, we, you know, overall, one of our indicators we're looking for is a 25% reduction in mediations. Um, and, and kind of early data points are showed a, re a reduction. We'd like to say that some of that is attributed to what we've had with IEP facilitators being able to really lean into those more complex teams. Um, also, um, I would say anecdotally ongoing is just that level of like relief and support a school feels if they have a complex case that we're able to say someone else is coming in to help you facilitate or to coach you in this work. Um, and just for us to be able to have kind of that targeted audience around professional learning that not all, that just is focused on IEP teams and special education services and the availability of those folks to also be able to support um, in schools with whether that's coaching with a special educator on how the IEPs, you know, being implemented, et cetera. So it's kind of just allows that what a, a person of focus around the special education process is really kind of um, that not kind of, but is a benefit of where that role falls, which is great. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, any more questions for Ms. Myers on her presentation? Ms. Myers, I thank you for presenting to us today. It was very informative and enlightening. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay, the next item on the agenda is Equity Committee meeting topics. And for that, I call on Mr. Douglas Handy. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Uh, before, I, before I continue, just want to uh, confirm that uh, Ms. Myers may be excused, and I think she may have already exited. So, oh, no, there she is. Uh, so it's okay for Ms. Myers to be excused, Dr. Savoy? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you again, thank Ms. You, Myers. Everyone. I appreciate your presentation. Of course. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Take care. Thank you. All right, so just wanted to uh, look forward into uh, remaining a remainder of our school year and uh, talk about a framework we'll use for uh, presentations for uh, this committee going forward. So you see here on the screen, these are our uh, four areas for the system as outlined um, by Dr. Rogers. So for this afternoon, uh, you just heard, you know, the update on the special education strategic plan, which would be part of our focus area one academic achievement. Um, Within that area, we also have ESOL. We know we have changes with uh, really the uh, dismantling, if you will, of our ESOL centers and students returning to their home schools. So I'll be bringing you all an update uh, with staff from ESOL to talk about that up. Um, those plans are also part of focus area one. Um, regarding focus area four, um, highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff, you all will recall when we had our meeting with the uh, equity advisory there was quite a bit of discussion around our professional development schools and our work with um, interns so um, i do have a presentation um, in the works for you all for january um, from our uh, office of teacher development and they'll be able to answer questions you all had and engage in further discussion and give you really an overview of our professional development school 
program and our intern program as well. So that'll be part of focus area four. Um, and then also I'll be bringing some presentations from um, focus area two infrastructure and focus area three safety and climate. So just wanted to present this as our through line going forward. Um, so making sure that um, I'm bringing you all topics that are in alignment with our system goals and that we have uh, you know, a framework uh, for any topics that you all might want to uh, bring forward as well. So with that, I'll pause just to see if you have any questions or comments on that, um, or if you have uh, you know, any topics that you would like to see that would fit within our um, four focus areas as well. Dr. Savoy, I have a question. It's Ms. Lichter. Yes, Ms. L uh, Chair Lichter. We recognize you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, and I know, like I'm thinking like two minutes ago, like the questions we had could have been the same questions we would have asked if she presented that in any committee. Mm -hmm. So how do we, like, so I should have been asking more pointed questions, or I think I should have been asking more questions that really had that equity lens, since that is mm -hmm. the focus of this committee. So, you know, as you think about the presentations going forward, is there a way, instead of like just putting questions at the end, is there a way to kind of help us think through how to focus our questions to really get at the heart of the equity component to that presentation? So like if I think back two minutes ago, because I didn't do it, was the whole disproportionality of how kids are identified and the over identification of students of color. So should that have been the focus, I was asking questions that were helpful to, to me as a board member moving forward, which is still necessary, but should we have been asking more questions or should the focus or slant of that presentation been more towards the equity issue or component of the presentation? And I don't know how my fellow board members feel about that, but um, I think if you could help us with that piece, thinking through the questions or really helping the presenter you know, a little bit more emphasis on that piece. I don't know um, what Dr. Savoy or Felicia or Ms. Stileski are thinking. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I also was asking general questions um, and maybe as part of our training. training that, right. Um, that um, I know we're using that MAVE handbook mm -hmm. and I honestly don't remember if there's anything about what Ms. Lichter mentioned in the handbook, but maybe as a separate piece of our training, that could be something that we could um, consider. Right? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yep, okay. Mr. Handy, what um, do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so Dr. Savoy, did you have a comment? I certainly oh, wanted to respond. Not on that, but go, go on. Okay. And I do have something to say shortly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, thank you both, uh, Ms. Lecter and Ms. Tulesky, for your um, for your um, input, your questions. So certainly the second part, I think, Ms. Lecter, what you talked about. Um, so as you know, as a liaison to the committee, as presentations are prepared and I review them and vet them, certainly want to make sure our presenters um, are bringing an equity focus in their presentations, um, which I think will result in you know, questions you all ask and discussions we have really being um, really centering equity. So it's certainly there's work I can do with fellow staff up front to make sure that happens. And I am thinking forward to our, our January meeting um, where, you know, even in reaching out to fellow staff, if you all recall, the questions you asked were very much around, you know, like uh, the demographics of our interns and, you know, um, HBCUs versus PWIs as far as, you know, the comparison and the ratio. So yes, absolutely. I'll make sure I do that work up front. And then I think that'll flow into our discussions. And then um, Ms. Tulesky, as you talked about, I think with um, the training we're gonna engage in ongoing, um, I think it's gonna help build that muscle, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. where um, we'll certainly be able to apply to our presentations and other topics that you all, um, you know, decisions you all are making as board members. So, but I'll, I'll certainly make sure I'm keeping that in mind as we go through. So the four focus areas and also absolutely with equity at the center. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. She talked about uh, African-American mm -hmm. students being disproportionately, you know, placed in uh, special ed programs. That's always been the case. Mm -hmm. And until you have a, uh, do away with that 84 to 12%, 84 white teachers and 12% black, it's going to continue because 
our children don't even have a chance. And when I say my children, I'm talking about children of color. They never have a chance when they come into certain classrooms and immediately singled out if they even breathe wrong for having some type of special ed issue. So that's just what I'm saying. And I don't want to get off on that today. <laughs> anyway, so I don't want to overstep. We'll Thank you, Dr. Boy. Um, <laughs> may, may I respond or follow up comment? Yes. So um, I know uh, Ms. Myers was uh, discussing some of the, um, I guess, quick wins or some of the things that have been happening and partnerships. So really addressing to what uh, Dr. Savoy mentioned, we are engaging um, the special ed department and we have, um, you know, I'm thinking it's about 30 to 40 staff members who we've been engaging in our, um, our equity training, uh, really to help build their capacity to be more equitable on applying an equity lens and all the work they do. Um, and I'm thinking, because I know that the disproportionality is something, as Dr. Savoy said, has been there for a while. So maybe even specifically addressing that, there might be a follow-up opportunity for us as a committee to look at. Um, so the equity training, of course, is, is just the beginning. What we're looking for is how that training actually changes practice. Um, so what we would see ultimately, and what you all would see is, you know, a reduction in um, that disproportionality, you would see that being eliminated over time. And um, until that happens, we know we still have work to do. So just to let you know that we are partnering, um, you know, with the Department of Special Education to, to try to disrupt um, the disproportionality and other patterns that are inequitable for, for any student, student groups. Thank you. You're welcome. So Dr. Savoy, that's all I had. And if, unless there's any other questions from uh, committee members, I will turn it back over to you. I muted myself. I'm very sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. OK, all right. Thank you, everyone, for participating this evening. All right, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting with the Equity Council is scheduled for Thursday, January 11, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. The next equity committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 18, 2024 at 4.00 p.m. Is there any further business? Okay, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you all.